she points to testimony that Mr. Jelly attended a meeting of top police investigators during the kidnapping to discuss the, to discuss the political aims of the terrorists. Mr. Jelly is thought to have been hostile to cooperation between the Christian Democrats and the Communists, which Morrow fostered. So apparently, Liceo Jelly was involved with the negotiations uh, that regard with the investigation, I should say, of the kidnapping of Aldo Moro, a former Italian prime minister who was kidnapped and murdered by the Red Brigades. Now, the uh, article here indicates that uh, just before Moro's kidnapping and murder, Moro had been proposing to allow the communists direct participation in the Italian government for the first time. Now, this presumably would be of uh, great distaste to Licio Gelli, a lifelong anti-communist, and not only if, I uh, say if, uh, the Red Brigades and Licio Gelli are indeed directly connected, as the par- Italian Parliamentary Commission has maintained, then uh, Licio Gelli's motive for participating with the Red Brigades might have very well have been to defame the left in Italy, in other words, to use the Red Brigades as provocateur. The Aldo Moro killing basically... Uh, did was disastrous for the popularity of the left and specifically the Communist Party in Italy, and uh, it also, of course, eliminated someone who could have, who was, in fact, promoting a situation that would have been beneficial for the uh, Italian Communist Party, namely their formal participation in the government and uh, their their cooperation with the Christian Democrats. So Licio Gelli is conferring with the top police investigators, allegedly investigating the Red Brigades, which he apparently helped to found. And again, the a uh, possibility here that the Red Brigades are functioning in essence as a kind of uh, provocateur organization is uh, something to consider, something to consider in connection with Licio Gelli's involvement with the Red Brigades, and something to consider uh, with regard to the uh, other, basically other Western elements and uh, Western intelligence services that we find connected with the Italian Red Brigades. Interestingly enough, another organization that connects with the Red Brigades and has worked in conjunction with them is the Camorra, the Neapolitan Criminal Syndicate, which uh, is also uh, very much affiliated with the political right in Italy and has, uh, well, has achieved some fairly notorious... Pro- has achieved a lot of notoriety recently through some uh, very bloody shootouts and massacres uh, dealing with some of the internecine warfare within the Camorra. Again, the Camorra is the organized crime syndicate operating out of Naples. Again, research credit for the following two articles goes to Ted Rubenstein. He got the following article from The Guardian, formerly the Manchester Guardian. It's a respected British daily. This article is headlined, Red Brigades in Blood Packed Link. That's from George Armstrong, who's the Guardian's represent, Guardian's uh, correspondent in Rome. This is from The Guardian of June 22nd, 1983. With more than 500 alleged Camorra members or sympathizers now imprisoned in various parts of Italy after last week's police crackdown... Further information about the links between the Neapolitan underworld and the Red Brigades have come to light. The Camorra, according to the Italian press, had agreed to kill several people designated by the Red Brigades as a result of a blood pact, unquote, between the two criminal groups. The hub of the story is the Red Brigade's kidnapping in 1981 of Mr. Ciro Cirillo, C-I-R-I-L-L-O, a Christian Democrat leader in Naples. He was released about three months later, and the terrorists then claimed that they had received the equivalent of 700,000 pounds, but that a larger ransom had, in fact, been paid. The Christian Democrat Party has always denied having paid any ransom, and clearly the Cirillo family did not pay. The victims said that friends, unquote, had raised the ransom. According to the four Camorra members who have turned informant and are under police protection, the Camorra leader, Mr. Raffaele Cutolo, C-U-T-O-L-O, then in prison, had been asked by the Christian Democrats to intervene with the Red Brigades in the Cirillo case. Mr. Cutolo agreed, but asked for a letter acknowledging a party's, the party's request from, the nationally, from a nationally known figure. He was given the letter. He then demanded other favors in the party, which would, which would have reduced police harassment of the Camorra and he asked that he be transferred to a hospital for the insane, similar to the one from which he had escaped with the use of dynamite in 1979. Mr. Cutolo was, after Mr. Cirillo's release, transferred instead to an island off Sardinia where he remains. The Camorra and the Red Brigades then shared the 1.3 million pound ransom. In connection with the shooting of the Pope, this, uh, basically we took a look at the massive pattern of cooperation between organized crime in Italy and the political right. So it's strange to see the Camorra cooperating with the Red Brigades here. 
Another interesting uh, organization that we find uh, offering support to the Red Brigades, this apparently turned down, concerns the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, which apparently also was willing to help out the Red Brigades. Research credit for the following story also goes to Ted. And uh, this story he got from us from the Dallas Morning News of June 4th, 1983. This is a Reuters story headlined, Israel and PLO offered brigades arms, study says. It's dateline Rome. Both the Israeli secret services and extremist factions of the PLO offered arms to the Red Brigade's urban guerrillas during the 1970s, an Italian parliamentary report says. The report, based on a three-year inquiry by an all-party committee of 40 deputies and senators, says the brigades had received arms from Palestine Liberation Organization radicals in 1978 and 79, but refused the Israeli offer made in 1974. The report concludes, quote, that the committee considers it credible that the Israeli secret services sought to establish a link with the Red Brigades in 1974, unquote. That conclusion, the report says, was formed by the fact that almost all the Red Brigade's leaders were aware of an attempt by the Israeli secret services by the Israeli secret services to make contact with the organization through an offer of arms and money, unquote. Those questioned as a basis for the report included imprisoned members of the Red Brigades, police, and political figures. The report suggests that the Israelis made the offer because they believed that instability in Italy, a key U.S. ally in the Mediterranean basin, would prompt Washington to commit itself more heavily to Israel. Israel also believed that activity by the Red Brigades was detrimental to the Communist Party's chances of participating in government, a development that might have led to the development of a pro-Arab line, the report says. So, uh, the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, also willing to work on behalf of the Red Brigades, although apparently their assistance was turned down. Worth noting in this context that uh, Israel wished to support the Red Brigades because they felt that it would do harm to the Italian Communist Party. Again, we see aid offered to the Red Brigades, possibly in order to use them as provocateur. And again, their possible role as agent provocateur, as basically terrorists set up in order to discredit the cause they ostensibly represent is uh, something we have to keep in mind here. Now, one of the crimes that has been most associated with the, well, one of the Red Brigade's crimes which has received a great deal of publicity in the United States concerns the kidnapping of U.S. General, John, basically U.S. General Dozier, James Dozier, uh, by the Red Brigades in 1981. Dozier was serving with the U.S. Army's contingent uh, stationed with NATO in Europe, and uh, Dozier was kidnapped by the Red Brigades, who apparently forced him to listen to rock and roll music and a number of other things. Interesting that uh, a labor, an Italian labor leader and his wife, have uh, their names have been very central to the um, investigation of the kidnapping of General Dozier, and they have recently been indicted in his kidnapping, and we're going to take a look at them and some of their connections in just a second. Following stories from the New York Times of Tuesday, August 14th of 1984. State line Rome headlined, 180 Red Brigade suspects named an Italian indictment. Investigators indicted 180 purported members of the Red Brigades today on charges related to the abduction of Brigadier General James L. Dozier of the United States and other terrorist activities. The indictments follow the third judicial investigation of the Red Brigade since the abduction and killing of former Prime Minister Aldo Moro in 1978. Those indicted include a former union leader and his wife who were accused of trying to buy for Bulgarian agents any information the Red Brigades may have obtained from General Dozier after his kidnapping in December of 1981. Nothing came of the approaches by the labor leader, Luigi Sricciolo, a former head of the International Office of the Labor Federation, UIL, and his wife, Paula, according to the indictment. General Dozier was freed by the police after 42 days. So, apparently, not only was Dozier kidnapped by Red Brigades, but one of the people working with the Red Brigades in order to allegedly get information wrung from General Dozier to the Warsaw Pact countries was this Luigi Stricciolo and his wife, Paula. It does not mention in this article that his wife's full name is Paolo Elia. Now, we're going to take a look at an interesting uh, connection that Paolo Elia, wife of and uh, alleged uh, cohort of Luigi Stricciolo has. Now, Paolo Elia, and uh, keep in mind now the connection of Luigi Stricciolo and Paolo Elia to the Red Brigades just mentioned, Paolo Elia is basically very friendly with, apparently associated with a fellow named Michael Ledeen, last name L-E-D-E-E-N. Now, Michael Ledeen is a uh, 
far right wing ideologue and spokesman, uh, allegedly a political researcher. In fact, his research does not bear out particularly well. Uh, his thesis of uh, Soviet support for uh, worldwide terrorism has been discounted by even elements of CIA, among other things. And uh, Michael Levine, along with Claire Sterling, have been among those most uh, vocally uh, espousing the notion that the Bulgarians and the KGB were behind the shooting of the Pope. Well, we spent about six months uh, delving into that and found that that basically lacked substance. Now, interestingly enough, Michael Ledeen, who has been very much involved with the Reagan administration and most recently has been uh, very much involved with the alleged Grenada Papers, supposedly uh, documents found after the U.S. invasion of Grenada, which revealed that indeed the, US, uh, the Soviet Union and Cuba were, were going to use Grenada as a basis for aggression in uh, the Americas, that basically Michael Ledeen has been very much involved with the Grenada Papers and has been one of the uh, guiding lights of the new right in recent years. And uh, Michael Ledeen in particular has been working with the Georgetown Institute for Strategic and International Studies, which is a right-wing think tank which is whose star has been rising uh, very, very rapidly in recent years, particularly during the Reagan administration. And anyway, Michael Ledeen uh, apparently was quite well acquainted with Paolo Elia, the wife of Luigi Sricciolo. Again, research credit for the following story goes to Ted Rubenstein, and the translation of this article, goes. To, the credit for that goes to Jonathan Marshall, currently the editorial page editor of the Oakland Tribune. This information comes from the Corriere della Sera of April 19, 1983. Paolo Elia, E-L-I-A, the wife of Luigi, Luigi Sricciolo, denies being part of his spy net. She also denies passing Michael Ledeen's card to Loris Sricciolo, L-O-R-I-S. Quote, yes, I knew him in the USA. I didn't know he was assistant to Haig. For me, he was the head of the Quarterly Review of Culture. So Michael Ledeen also, very close to former Reagan Secretary of State Alexander Haig, of course a former NATO general, a member of the Knights of Malta, someone we've talked about at considerable length. So interesting that uh, Michael Ledeen should connect up with Paolo Elia and Luigi Sricciolo, who in turn uh, were apparently working with the Red Brigades to get information uh, from General Dozier to the Warsaw Pact nations. And the, the last connection here of the Red Brigade that we're going to be looking at concerns the possibility of the CIA being connected with the Red Brigade, specifically through uh, the services of Edwin Wilson and Frank Turpel. Now, Edwin Wilson and Frank Turpel are the two allegedly ex-CIA agents whose efforts on behalf of Libya and other people we've looked at extensively in the past. Now, one of the things that we've looked at in connection with uh, the Triple Wilson gang, I guess you could call them, concerns the improbability, the great improbability that their efforts, that they were in fact ex-CIA agents at the time that they were helping to arm Gaddafi, among others. The uh, Triple Wilson series of corporate fronts, which were used in their machinations vis-a-vis Gaddafi, uh, involved not only millions of dollars, but uh, involved two people named uh, Theodore Shackley and Thomas Kleins, who were the numbers two and one man, respectively, in the CIA's uh, covert operations. Basically, they were, uh, I guess, Kleins was number one and Theodore Shackley number two in uh, the clandestine services division of the CIA. And until just before their involvement with the Turple and Wilson group of corporate fronts involved in their arms traffic, these two, uh, well, basically, they were numbers one and two with the CIA's clandestine services, and then they immediately become involved with Turple and Wilson. And... Uh, if you can accept the fact that those two individuals were involved with Turple and Wilson as in a series of companies which shipped 20 tons of plastic explosive, 350,000 timing devices in a fleet of cargo 747s, shipped them through CIA fronts without the knowledge of the CIA, then and only then can you accept the notion that Wilson and Turple were ex-CIA agents when they were working on behalf of Gaddafi. Again, information uh, to this effect has been presented at some length on uh, this broadcast before. Now, interestingly enough, among the beneficiaries of Wilson and Turple's efforts on behalf of Gaddafi were the Red Brigades. The following story uh, comes from the Washington Post of June 22, 1981. Research credit for this article goes to May Brussel, the dean of uh, researchers in this field. This is a UPI story, Dateline Philadelphia headline, Report Links to Ex-CIA Agents to Theft of Military Radar. Two former CIA agents being sought on charges of illegal arms sales to Libya have been linked to the theft of radar equipment from a naval, a naval test site in China Lake, California, the Philadelphia Bulletin reported today. 
The report named Frank E. Turple and Edwin P. Wilson as the subjects of a federal investigation into the theft of radar equipment from the U.S. Naval Testing Center at China Lake, a Southern California test center for sophisticated weaponry and electronic systems. Both men are being sought on federal, federal fugitive warrants on charges they sold large quantities of weapons and sensitive military equipment to Moamir Gaddafi's government in Libya. Turple and Wilson have also been accused in indictments of hiring former Green Berets to work in Libya, training members of international terrorist groups, including Italy's Red Brigades, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Irish Republican Army, the newspaper reported. That's uh, worth noting in this regard also that uh, at one point, Turple and Wilson, uh, basically Edwin Wilson was uh, recruiting funds from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration to set up a terrorist, a allegedly counter-terrorist training camp in the United States at which, among others, again, members of the Red Brigades would have been uh, operating. So, uh, again, keep in mind the almost certain links of Turple and Wilson to CIA uh, at the time they were uh, engaged in these uh, activities with Gaddafi and also Red Brigades and others. And, uh, again, consider the, what... Uh, the CIA would be doing with an organization like the Red Brigades. So uh, taking a look at the, the things that we've been uh, examining on the broadcast this evening, we began by taking a look at the role, according to the Italian Parliamentary Commission investigating the P2 Lodge, of, Ita of P2 Lodge Grand Master Licio Gelli in founding the Red Brigades. We also took a look at Gelli's role uh, basically conferring with the police officials investigating the kidnapping and murder of Aldo Moro when they were looking for Moro, Moro having been kidnapped by the Red Brigades on the eve of uh, precipitating communist participation in the Italian government. We also, after following that, we took a look at the role of the Camorra in not only committing some killings for the Red Brigades, but also in helping to free a Christian Democratic uh, politician that had been kidnapped by the Red Brigades. After that, we look at uh, we took a look at help offered by the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, to the Red Brigades. And uh, we also took a look at uh, the connections between Paolo Elia, the wife of an Italian labor leader, and James Dozier, who are uh, the connections between Paolo Elia and Michael Ledeen. Now, Paolo Elia and her uh, husband, Luigi Sriccolo, were allegedly involved in getting information from the kidnapped General Dozier, kidnapped by the Red Brigades, to Bulgaria. We also we took a look at uh, Michael Ledeen's connections to a number of things, including the Reagan administration. And the last thing we looked at was the connection between Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple of the CIA and the Red Brigades. Before winding things up tonight, I'm going to read you one more interesting connection between the Red Brigades and uh, somebody you wouldn't expect to see affiliated with an organization like that. Basically... In uh, the ad scam investigation, a fellow by the name of Mel Weinberg, a confidence man, a convicted criminal, became uh, basically the center of the FBI's investigation. Now, in turn, Mel Weinberg, the sting man, was the subject of a book authored by nationally syndicated columnist Bob Green, Robert W. Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. And his book about Mel Weinberg, titled The Sting Man, subtitled Inside Ad Scam, was published in hardcover by E.P. Dutton and Company, and was copyrighted in 1981. And interestingly enough, Mel Weinberg, the uh, confidence man, the sting man who figured so prominently in the FBI's ad scam investigation, Mel Weinberg was also involved with the funding of the Red Brigades. Apparently, Mel Weinberg provided the Red Brigades with certificates of deposit for offshore banks which served to finance many of the Red Brigades' activities. Again, this from The Sting Man by Bob Green. Weinberg is sitting in, a, in, a, in an Italian cave that overlooks the sea. The cave floor is covered with thick rugs. Weinberg sits at an exquisitely set dining table with Lady Diane, that was his uh, lady friend, and a crippled man with braces on both legs. An impeccably attired waiter, sniffing at Weinberg's request for pizza, serves entrees of veal scallopini alla marsala. Farther down the cave, a pianist plays Italian love songs. The cave belongs to Anthony, the crippled man whom Weinberg calls Squeaky. He is the son of a wealthy Italian contractor and is a leading fundraiser for the terrorist Red Brigade. Anthony's legs were ruined in an accident at a secret Rome bomb factory operated by the brigade. Weinberg keeps him supplied for $5,000 each with blank certificates of deposit from offshore banks, which Anthony uses to raise much more money for the brigade. Anthony's translator is Mario, his omnipresent bodyguard. 
Weinberg gazes, gazes around approvingly, lifts a wine glass to his host and says, Hey, Squeaky, being a commie bomb thrower ain't such a bad line of work. Unquote. Well, again, Mel Weinberg, the central figure in the FBI's ab scam investigation, a fundraiser for the Red Brigades. And throw that in with the P2 connections, with the Mossad connections, the Camorra connections, possible CIA connections, Ladine's connections to uh, the Cercello uh, Palo Ilia group. And you have an interesting picture. Uh, one can only speculate just what the motivation would be for the ties between these various elements and the Red Brigades, but uh, both with the Aldo Moro kidnapping and with the possible role of uh, the help offered to the Red Brigades by the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, the role of the Red Brigades in defaming the left was uh, was basically very upfront, and uh, certainly one of the motivations that uh, one should consider in evaluating just why these uh, organizations might have been involved with um, with the Red Brigades concerns their, the possible use of the Red Brigades as agent provocateur, in other words, using them as terrorists to discredit the cause they ostensibly represent. That basically concludes this broadcast. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. And uh, that concludes our hard-range segments for tonight. We have a few more articles left. A, c- a couple of quick points on that. Uh, by the way, Mel Weinberg, uh, it's been quite a while since Abscam. When I, say the, when I see, t- cited him as the central figure in the Abscam investigation, that wasn't uh, the central pig- figure being investigated. He was a, a, a key part of the FBI team that laid the, uh, the famous sting. Also, a factual correction, the Bob Green who authored the book, The Stingman, is not the syndicated columnist. He is the editor of Newsday. So, incorrect fact in that last one, Bob Green is the editor of Newsday, not the syndicated columnist. All righty. Anyway, we're going to go on now since we're down to the closing minutes here. We're going to jump into our various articles. Uh, we're going to continue to examine some of the German connections. And uh, this is from a book entitled, O Vatican, A Slightly Wicked View of the Holy See by Paul Hoffman. Copyright 1984 by Congdon and Weed. We're going to see it now in connection with the whole Vatican tangle, not necessarily having anything to do with P2 or the shooting of the Pope, but uh, we're going to come across the name of Hans Langemann, the Olympic security chief, in connection with, of all things, the Vatican. The ubiquitous Hans Langemann. In 1982, the left-wing magazine Konkret of Hamburg quoted a former officer of West Germany's Federal Information Service, Hans Langemann as asserting that in the late 1950s and in the 60s, he had run a spy ring inside the Vatican. It seems that the Bonn authorities at that time were most eager to learn everything about the Holy See's Ostpolitik, meaning politics to the East, and about a possible Vatican role in contacts between Italian communists, West German social democrats, and Eastern European governments. According to the disclosures in Concrete, the paid agents of the Bonn-directed network included a nobleman, a Jesuit, and an Italian prelate, codenamed Bruno, later promoted to Abbott, who produced valuable material not only from the Curia, but also from Italian government departments. At the time of the startling publication in the Hamburg magazine, Langemann had left West Germany's federal intelligence and was in the service of a security agency of the state of Bavaria. He was suspended and an investigation was opened. As is usual in such cases, a little was heard of its findings. The affair also had repercussions in the Vatican. John Paul II's Secretary of State, Cardinal Casaroli, was particularly upset by a report in the West German magazine Stern that copies of classified Curia documents, stealthily taken from desk drawers in his own office, had been made for Langemann. The material was said to have included a memorandum to Casaroli, preparatory to top-secret talks between him and a communist emissary from East Germany. A very well-informed prelate told me that Casaroli ordered a thorough inquiry, which ascertained that ecclesiastics had indeed been spying for Bonn in Rome and received payments for their undercover network. The espionage network was referred to in West German official reports as Operation Eva. All right, so uh, Hans Langemann crops up in connection with Vatican espionage. Make of that what you will, sort of dovetail that with the uh, 22 and a half hours of information from the Mediterranean merry-go-round, and uh, you will continue to go around on that same, self-same aforementioned merry-go-round. Now, obviously, terrorism of all sorts, and in particular, uh, Palestinian terrorism, real or apparent, 
uh, is very much in the news these days, and we're going to take a look at an incident involving, apparently, according to some people, Force 17, the uh, the Al Fatah security force founded by originally the uh, Ali Hassan Salome, who we've looked at for so much of the broadcast this evening. Now, this force has been cited, again, rightly or wrongly, as having been involved in, in a terrorist incident, which in turn precipitated a round of uh, terrorist retaliation on both sides. Three Israeli citizens were murdered in Cyprus in response to that, uh, an alleged Palestinian crime, perhaps a real Palestinian crime, but as we're going to see, there are doubts about just who the real authors are. Uh, in response to that, the Israelis bombed Tunisia, or bombed Tunis, I guess, and uh, in response to the Israeli bombing of Tunis, the PLO, or elements thereof, hijacked the Achille Loro ship, uh, the trial for that just concluded in Italy, and then in turn, in, re in retaliation for that, the United States forced down a Libyan airliner and took some people off of uh, No, I guess an Egyptian airliner and took some people off of that. So the particular incident we're about to look at, the murder of three Israelis in uh, Cyprus, is worth uh, taking stock of because of the, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, but it, it, it kicked off. A, uh, a chain reaction of terrorism, which uh, w was very much in the news uh, and, and figured prominently in the uh, among the lead stories of 1985. Reading from the Chronicle of September 30th, 1985, this is uh, an, a New York Times story, Dateline Nicosia, Cyprus, headline, Cyprus gunman identified as British citizen. One of the three gunmen who killed three Israelis aboard a yacht off Cyprus last week was identified over the weekend as a Briton. A Cypriot official identified the man as Ian Michael Davison of South Shields in northern England. The gunman had told Cypriot authorities that he that he was a Palestinian named George Hanna. On Wednesday, Davison and Elias Yahia Yassif and Mahmoud Khaled Abdullah, who identified themselves as Palestinians from Beirut, boarded a yacht moored in Larnaca, in Larnaca Harbor and shot the three Israelis aboard, a tent, aboard during a ten-hour siege by the police, Cypriot officials said. During the siege... The terrorists demanded the release of Palestinians captured by the Israeli Navy as they sailed toward southern Lebanon. Some of those captured were reported to be members of 417, the elite security unit of Yasser Arafat's El Fatah guerrilla organization. PLO officials denied any connection with the three. And in the uh, the enclosed photograph, it shows Ian Michael Davison, who I think Nip could be accurately described as uh, having sort of Aryan features. You know, striking note. And uh, this, we're not trying to jump draw any hard conclusions, but he sure doesn't look Palestinian. He has uh, a very a very obvious blonde hair, sort of the high Aryan cheekbones, quote unquote, and what appear to be blue eyes. Certainly look, uh, looking very Nordic and not at all Palestinian. And uh, whether there's anything to that uh, remains to be seen. Certainly there are a lot of questions about this incident. Remember now, 417 is Salome's group. Okay, now we're going to read an article that was sent to us by May Brussel. This is from The Observer, the, the London newspaper of Sunday, October 6, 1985. The headline is Shaky Case Against Arafat. The subhead is Mystery Remains Over Identity of the Larnaca Killers. Were the killers of the three Israelis at Larnaca on 25th of September Yasser Arafat's men? Israel's Prime Minister, Shimon Peres, is certain. Quote, there is absolutely no doubt, he said on Israeli television last Wednesday, that these people belonged to 417, the PLO chairman's bodyguard, and that it was done under the command of the force's commander, with Arafat's knowledge, unquote. Israel has made this charge the centerpiece of a campaign, an international campaign, to justify its airstrike last Tuesday against the headquarters of Arafat and 417 outside Tunis. Paris claims that men now in, is in Israeli custody identified the Larnaca killers, the Briton, Ian Davison, and his two Arab associates, as members of 417. Israel is holding the deputy commander of 417, Faisal Abu Shar, captured with other Palestinians when Israeli gunboats intercepted two small vessels making for Sidon from Cyprus in late August. As the Larnaca killers demanded the release of these men in exchange for the lives of two Israelis, they were holding hostage. This would also tend to link them to 417. But does the Israeli evidence stand up? There is first of all a puzzle about the nature of 417 itself. It was set up in the early 1970s by a close associate of Arafat, Ali Hassan Salome, who in 78 was killed by a Beirut car bomb believed to have been planted by Israeli agents. Skipping down in the article. The PLO man in London, Faisal Awhida, says bluntly that the three... This is a man giving information to uh, the newspaper. Says bluntly that the three murdered Israelis were known Mossad agents and that they were suspected of having provided Israel with information which led to the capture of the Palestinian boats in August. Were the Larnaca murders then just another violent episode in the ceaseless war between hostile secret services? 
No, says Ojeda. Quote, Cyprus is not is a friendly island. Our men had orders not to attack. Our view is that the killers did it on their own account. It may have been a personal vendetta to avenge the men kidnapped by Israel. In any event, we do not know who the killers are, but I can say that there is no way in which an Englishman like Davison could have been a member of Chairman Arafat's personal bodyguard. Unquote. Okay. Oh. So basically, uh, we have the 417 connection and questions about Ian Davison and uh, his real uh, his real affiliation. And bear in mind the uh, the physical appearance of the man that I just described. And listen to the following research credit for this goes to Ted Rubenstein. This also is from the London Observer. This one from the Observer of September 19th or uh, September 29th, 1985. It's by Nigel Hawks and Ari Haskell and Martin Bailey. And it's headlined, Britain in, PLO La- Britain in PLO Yacht Murder Squad. One of the gunmen who murdered three Israeli holidaymakers aboard a yacht in Larnaca Harbor last week has been identified as an Englishman Ian Davison of South Shields. Police in Cyprus yesterday confirmed that the tall, fair-haired gunman who had claimed to be a Palestinian called George Hanna was in fact Davison who joined the Palestine Liberation Organization more than two years ago. Skipping down into the article, Davison claimed that as a young man he had been a skinhead, a real young fascist thug, unquote. But his father, Sam Davison, 52, says that he was never involved in violence and he never mentioned politics. And skipping down in the article still further, the latest in a series of terrorist incidents took place on Thursday night when a bus was attacked in the village of Halhul and seven passengers, two Arabs and five Jews, were wounded. Later, an anonymous caller told the French news agency bureau in Jerusalem that the PLO's Force 17 was responsible, the same group that the Israelis say was behind the Larnaca killings. The Nicosia office of the PLO denied that for, denied the Force 17, the elite secret service of the PLO, was involved and denounced the Larnaca killings as harmful to relations between the PLO and Cyprus. So bear in mind the admitted fascist sympathies of Ian Davis when he, when he was young and ask uh, whether the same ambiguous pattern that we've been looking at all evening, uh, stretching from 417 and Ali Hassan Salome with the roots going back to the Mufti, Skorzeny, his father, and so forth, uh, it really uh, it, it's suggestive of the same pattern. However, what conclusions one can draw remains to be seen. Broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. That winds it up for this evening. We obviously haven't got any time to sum up. Uh, hopefully, as with our Mediterranean merry-go-round, the facts begin speaking for themselves. If anybody, by the way, in a, in a future program has any questions, give us a call, and we'd be glad to sort of wrap some of this up or try and sum it up as best we can. Uh, bearing in mind the massive uh, size of the program and given the fact that, you know, our abilities to do that in a, in a limited frame of time are limited.